Welcome to the China Leadership Dilemma podcast. My name is Jin Xu, your host, and today we will explore the impactful nuances of culture through the deepest levels of awareness with our guest, Larry Wong. Larry Wong is founder and CEO of Zisan Wong, a career and talent development platform for global caliber professionals. He's also the founder and CEO of Wong and Lee Asia Resources, an international recruitment firm that he started in Asia and basically in China in 1994. Larry is an American like me, but he's been living and working in China for more than 20 years. Larry, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Gene. And by the way, great to see you. We haven't seen each other in a long time. So uh, yeah, you're looking good. It's been a while. So uh, can you first begin the show and please tell our audience just a little bit about yourself, where you are from, and what do you do? Okay, so uh, Gene, I'm, I'm I'm the classic ABC. You know, my my folks are from the old country, so I'm referring to uh, China. Uh, my dad's Shanghainese, and uh, the interesting thing is um, where I'm sitting right now, which is in downtown Shanghai. If you know Shanghai, it's Jing'an District. The house where my dad grew up is actually about a kilometer away. So you know, uh, I could walk there in about ten minutes. You know, it, it's still there. Um, and then my mom is uh, from Guangzhou. Uh, you know, but they immigrated to the States. Uh, my dad went uh, for graduate school, my mom when she was a teenager. And, uh, you know, my brother, sister and I were born and raised in, in the States. Uh, I actually grew up <laughs> my first few years in the South. I actually grew up in North Carolina uh, for the first eight years. I, I had a Southern drawl and uh, I was a little Chinese kid running around. My brother and sister and I, we were the only because um, my folks were academics, you know. So and I wouldn't say I had an interest in China at all. You know, growing up, even uh, up and through university, I mean, you know, we get together with our our, our uh, my dad's family, my mom's family um, uh, around the holidays, eat Chinese food. That was that was it for me, pretty much. But I I really had no curiosity or real interest in China, and so um, it really was a big turning point for me when I I came to China for the first time. I was twenty five years old. My brother and I were asked. I say asked, but it was really forced by my mom to accompany my grandmother to China because she wanted to go on a tour. And this is back in 1985, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, so I uh, went there and it was, uh, I always refer to it as an awakening. It was uh, just an eye-opening experience for me. And I was just kind of like, just uh, I was living in LA at the time, by the way. You know, in fact, not far from where you are. I, I was working in... Um, uh, Living, living in Westwood and, and working in uh, uh, like El Segundo, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, LA, enjoying the weather. Uh, you know, I had a, like a 8.30 to 4.30 job, very casual. And then I came to China and, and uh, I, I just felt this huge kind of appreciation and this, this feeling of humility of how fortunate I, I am as an ethnic Chinese to have been born and raised in the United States. And it really made me think a lot about how, how I was pursuing my life, which I, was, I would describe it as I was kind of taking it for granted. Do you know what I'm saying? And just kind of living day to day and just looking for things to do to entertain myself, right? But when I was in China, I met all these uh, people that were really looking at me like I was something special. And I didn't feel that way and I didn't view myself as that way, but they saw me as that way. And the reason they saw me that way, and this is again in 1985, um, was because I was just born in the land of opportunity, United States, mm -hmm. right? And I just had, I didn't have anything guaranteed to me, but I, I had opportunities. I had, uh, you know, the chance to do things that I desired to do, which they did not. Mm -hmm. And that just really uh, uh, affected me in a, in a very profound and deep way. And from that point on, I started really thinking about what I was doing, my purpose, and, and it, it inspired me. It really inspired me. Yeah. Did you have a lot of distant relatives in China that you met in 1985? Uh, let's see. Uh, yes, yes. But, you know, at that time, <laughs> I, I, I had taken one year of, of Mandarin in, in uh, college, okay? okay. And, and that was like when I was a freshman. So I hadn't spoken Chinese in about seven, eight, nine years. So I was just hacking around, and, and, and of course, the English level wasn't very good at that time 
for most Chinese, except for our tour guides, except for our tour guides. But um, so I met some of the relatives, but you know, it was kind of thing where you just, you know, both of us are just smiling and, you know, <laughs> you know, doing this, you know, we, we couldn't really communicate that much. But a lot of my um, immediate family, aunts and uncles, you know, all my cousins are, were, we all had immigrated, you know, uh, my, my mom and dad and their brothers and sisters all immigrated to the States, but I did have distant cousins that I had known nothing about. And, um, and also distant aunts and uncles that I met for the first time during that trip. Yes. Now, are you still in contact with them today? Your distant cousins? Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, I see them every once in a while. In fact, I was just in the U.S. last week. My dad gave me some cod liver pills or something, uh, uh, fish oil pills. He wants me to give to his cousin, which is my uncle. But, um, you know, I'm pretty old, Gene, and, and they're even older. So uh, uh, they're, um, <laughs> you know. A lot of them are not, not around anymore. And then the cousins are all spread out all over the place. I'm really not sure where they are. But they're, they're pretty distant cousins. I'm close to my American uh, cousins, uh, meaning the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the kids of my aunts and uncles in the United States, yes. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, wow. So, actually, how long did you stay in China during that first trip? It was a month. It was a one-month one month trip, and... Um, we were basically going because my, my, my grandma and, and grandfather were, you know, how would you say? They were uh, very influential uh, in their day in the 1930s. Uh, um, my, my, my grandfather was governor of Guangzhou and uh, he was minister of the interior. Um, and my grandmother, uh, with the uh, support of my, my grandfather, started a um, kind of a, uh, these schools and homes for orphans during the Japanese war. And they basically took in, I think it was over 13,000 orphans. And they ran like 11 schools and about 1,000 per school. And so the purpose of the trip was my grandmother to, to do a tour. And she was, we were met in every city. We, we visit like seven, eight cities. So we started in Beijing, but we went to Shanghai. We went to Guilin. We went to uh, uh, Xi'an, right? Terracotta soldiers. We even went to Dunhuang, right? Uh, the, the kind of desert and things like that. Um, and uh, and then the last stop was uh, 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 Guangzhou, right? And in Guangzhou, uh, 500 of these uh, war orphans that my grandmother had basically uh, taken in during the Japanese war because they were separated from their parents who were either killed or they were just separated, right, during the war. 500 of these orphans showed up, and they were in their 50s and 60s. So they were basically grandparents, and they have not seen my grandmother in – probably 40 years. Mm -hmm. And then when, then, and, and when they saw her, they called her mom. And they basically, they have a sign that is in Chinese, I was told, it says, no, you, know us. And they were just in tears of happiness, of just like, just gratitude. And just, it was amazing. It was amazing. And my grandmother, who all that time, she was like, she was 70 years old at the time. It's my grandmother. But when she stood up on the stage and her stature, all of a sudden, she was the principal of the school they were her children, and it was just, uh, uh, I was just standing there in, in awe, and, and I was just, that was part of my experience that, that really, like I said, moved me and kind of made me realize of what kind of an impact that, that people in my family have had, you know, on this, this country, yeah. And so that kind of inspired me to think about, you know, what kind of impact potentially uh, I could have or a contribution I could make, you know, right? With, with, who I was, meaning my my ethnic background, but my American background, and how could I take the best of both worlds and and, and make the make something of it? Yeah. yeah. Now this was your first trip to China, 1985. Uh, yeah. Were you working at the time in the U.S. Did you have to take a? I was. I, I I was. You might know because I I was working for Mattel. You know, so my my first career it was let's see, like two lifetimes ago, uh, was as a uh, R and D design engineer. I designed toys for a living, right? And um, I, I think uh, I'd worked there for like three or four years. Yeah, yeah, at that time. And you just basically I, accumulated all your holidays to take one month off or how did that work? I think I asked for a bit of a leave because of the, it's like, you know, hey, this is kind of family. And, you know, my, I, I worked had a great boss and, you know, they were very, uh, uh, you know, just uh, supportive, right, like that. And so I... I might have accumulated some holidays, but they, they let me, um, you know, take that additional time off. Yeah. 
Okay, so let's forward. But it was it was a great trip. Yeah, yeah. Let's fast forward to when was the next time you were in China? Right. And what was your reason for coming the next time? How long between 1985, your first time, and your mm. next? Time? So um, I might have taken a trip to China uh, after that, but you know I actually moved to China in 1990. So you mentioned at the beginning of your broadcast, I've been here over 20, 20 uh, years. It's coming up on 30. Yeah. It's coming up on 30. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Well, and, and then, you know, and I've, I've kind of done a tour of duty. I started in Taipei, four years, Hong Kong, five years, and I was there over the handover years, right? So 1997 was the handover. I was there from 94 to 99. And then uh, since 99, about mid-99, I've been in, uh, you know, uh, uh, mainland China, um, most of the time in Shanghai. I started in Shanghai for a year and a half, but I, then I spent six years in Beijing. And, and now, now the last uh, maybe almost 10 years back in Shanghai. Yeah. Okay. And this was all, uh, this was all on behalf of your recruiting business that you were doing in Asia. How did you get involved with recruiting when you started off as an engineer? Uh, so, well, so, so the, the the quick beginning of that story is like um, after I came back from China, I I I because I, I was just kind of you could say going through the motions as an engineer. Right. I have no real passion for an engineer. I have the aptitude for it because I'm a I'm a a Chinese guy, <laughs> so my aptitude for math and science is pretty good. And it was kind of by default that I I chose engineering. You know Chinese families. I, I was actually pre-med, you know, because your, your Chinese parents, particularly your mom, want you, your Chinese kids to be doctors. <laughs> yeah. So I spent my first two years in uh, college uh, as a pre-med. But there was no way I was going to make it through med school because I have no interest in it. And I didn't really have an interest in engineering, but, you know, I, it was a kind of a process of elimination. But I had this great job, but it was a great company. Mattel, toy design, you know, it kind of suits my personality. But um, uh, I, I, it... it it wasn't something that like I got up every morning and go like, oh God, you know, I got a great job. I'm going to make toys for a living. Although it is a great career, it is a great job, it is a great industry, a great company, right? So, you know, you could say fit is the key word. It wasn't a very good fit for me, you know. Mm -hmm. So then I went and got my MBA. You might know my story. Um, I, I left that after about five and a half years, and then I went to UCLA for my MBA mm -hmm. to just remove myself from this comfort zone and just kind of this cruising uh, kind of environment where I was just going through the motions to really uh, uh, um, kind of, uh, you could say, uh, uh, start my journey to search for what it was that I was quote unquote meant to do. Right. And I didn't know what that was. I just knew it wasn't engineering, right? Yeah, but I, uh, I would define it as business. And I only knew three things. Like I call them, uh, in fact, I, I use this um, when I do a lot of uh, career coaching. Uh, I only uh, identified three elements, three elements at the time. I didn't know the objective. Uh, I didn't know the destination, but um, there were three elements that I had decided or determined for myself that I wanted to be a part of everything I did from that point on. The first one was business because I'm more of a, you might be able to tell, you know, I can do this as an engineer. I can look at a computer screen for 12 hours a day, eight hours a day, but I'm really more of a people person, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, engagement and then that really brings out you know my my passion my energy you know the best in me okay so people was the first thing the second i'm sorry business was the first thing the second was helping people i, I wanted to do things that where i could have an impact on uh i don't know providing some type of benefit or uh, uh service or, or help to improve the lives of others kind of in in the spirit of what my grandmother and grandfather did you know with their or you know you know, like their, their orphans' uh, homes and uh, um, schools, okay? And then the third was China, right? Because, you know, I, I love my lifestyle in, in the United States. I was really enjoying myself in Los Angeles, right? But I feel like uh, if you use the word impact, where I felt I could have the bigger impact, okay? Again, taking the best of both worlds from my Western U.S. American background and Chinese background, that I thought China would be the place for it. Because I didn't know much about China. I only knew that it was the Pacific century, because this was back in 1990, right? And um, there was going to be huge development, huge growth, huge potential. You could say a wave, you know, 
the, you know, the start of this wave that was taking place. And I wanted to kind of try to ride that wave, you know. Right. Yeah. Now, did you did you first start business in China just as an entrepreneur or were you employed? Oh, yeah. So so the, the, the story. So I, I started working for Wang Computers. So I, that was my first corporate business side of engineering, manufacturing, r and and it was Wang Computers that that sent me over. I was expatted to Taipei in 1990, right? Uh, I joined as a management trainee. I went through a rotation. And after about a year and a half, I was sent over uh, to, to Taipei. And so getting back to the recruitment business, um, number one, I never had aspirations to be an entrepreneur, to start my own company. It, it wasn't in my DNA. It's not part of my family's background or my friends are, you know, I have no influences about that. And then the second was, I'm not an HR person. I have no HR background. I have no recruitment background. I had never done it before. Okay. But after I got sent out by Wang Computers, and, and if you know, you, know, you might be of that generation, Wang Computers was in its day mentioned IBM, HP, Compact, Wang Computers, right? Now, now it's just like a memory, right? But during the days I was there, you know, the whole industry was shifting from hardware to software, right? You know, and from uh, product selling to solution selling. Big shift. And so Wang Computers was one of the, um, the victim, well, not the victim, um, the, uh, the uh, fallouts from that time. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it didn't make it. You know, IBM shifted from hardware to consulting, IBM consulting. But Wang tried to do that, but failed. Okay. And so after my two-year um, contract, and for this expat assignment was up, I was kind of like, what do I do next? And so I joined my friend's startup, kind of IT consulting. So I was still leveraging this, you know, technology background. I did that for a year and a half, and then it didn't quite work out. I mean, we were doing okay, but I didn't see a future in it. And then I was just literally lying in bed for three days, staring at the ceiling. <laughs> What's my next move? You know, like that. And then I, I came up with this idea about, you know, because I'm into people. I'm into talent. And I had started an organization back then in 1992 called CAPT, Chinese American Professionals in Taiwan. And if, if you've ever been to China, American Chamber, right? But think of it as a mini AmCham for younger generation Americans, particularly Chinese Americans or these Sinophiles, Asianophiles, right? Because AmCham traditionally was for those expat, gray hair, 40s, 50s, top executives. But I'm a mid-career person, right? I'm just a manager, junior manager, something like that, right? But I, I speak some of the language. I'm, I'm here not because my company necessarily offered me an opportunity because I wanted to be here. So I, I initiated the, the, uh, the whole move to come out here. And then there was this new generation of people like me back in the early 90s, right, that were doing the same thing. And we're ethnic Chinese, but we're all fish out of water. Right. And so... I have kind of come up with this idea to find uh, the organization. These days, you have internet. In those days, you don't have internet. You don't have social media. So, but to try to collectively um, support each other, create a community, and to uh, uh, you know uh, learn learn about this region and how we can be effective in this region, right? Like that. So it was a professional organization. Of course, it had a social aspect, but we would have guest speakers and talk about marketing in china or marketing in taiwan or the legal industry or the you know consumer product industry you know things like that you know yeah and so it was from that because people always used to tell me and uh uh larry you're so passionate about this it wasn't my job i had my day job this was my part-time job it's a volunteer organization right uh you should do this full-time i go this is not a job you know i can't make a living with membership fees and charging people for monthly events, you know, but I, the whole purpose of the organization was to support the success of, you know, uh, bilingual global caliber talent, you know, during this time. Right. Mm -hmm. And so then you go, aha, that sounds a little bit like the mandate of Wong and Lee. Right. So I always tell people that Wong and Lee Asia Resources, my recruitment firm, which I started in 1994, was born out of CAPT, mm. right? My enthusiasm, my passion, my, my understanding of the needs of and, and, and the challenges that we face as, um, say, uh, uh, foreigners working in China. Yeah. 
So that was the early days, and that's how I started Wong and Lee. Um, again, not because of uh, of, of my skill sets or or my experience, because of this huge need that I recognized. Yeah, yeah. Well, right. you've really that's you know the, that journey is amazing because you not only I mean you were talking about you 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 were in Hong Kong during the handover in 1997, but you've also been yeah. in you've been in China and you've been in Asia during this whole rise of China from, yeah. I mean, I guess technically China still considers itself a, a developing economy, but nobody who lives and works in China considers China still developing. You've probably seen this transition firsthand of how when you first went to China in the eighties, China was still very kind of backward yeah. and, and you know there were you, you couldn't even figure out where you could go to an ATM and maybe get cash. And now China has now yeah <laughs> digitized than even in the U.S. with payments and stuff like that. Yeah, um, definitely. Uh, you could say that, Gene. I, I've definitely had a front row seat. I mean, um, I, I don't know officially say China really started developing to what it is today. You know what I'm saying? But honestly, I rem remember the first, first uh, you know, uh, uh, Hagen dazs the first, uh, you know, uh, ability to, to uh, you know, I don't know, just, uh, you know, Pizza Hut. I, I remember the, of, of all those when they first entered uh, this, this part of the world, you know, because I've, I've been there almost 30, here almost 30 years. Yeah, like that. Yeah. And I have followed like the interesting trend. When I went to Taipei, Taipei had a lot of money and it was attracting a lot of uh, technology transfer. And then the handover years were fascinating. And then when I came to Shanghai in early, uh, in, in mid-19, you know, um, that, that was when China was taking off. And in addition to the economic development, I think my expertise is in, in seeing the talent development, you know, uh, um, story here. And, and that's what I'm into, career and talent development. And that's what my uh, uh, platform, uh, Jirshan Wang, yeah. is, is about. People yeah. in their career and talent development, you know. I want to dig a little bit more into your experience about, because you've worked with, I mean, you're in the recruiting industry, so you're working with both sides. You're working with the companies that want to hire talent, and you're working with yes. who wants to position themselves to be hired, whether it's- yes. I guess initially it would be by multinational companies or foreign companies, but now there's so many powerful multinational Chinese companies that that Correct. is completely Absolutely. Different. Absolutely. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little context, Gene. Like, so back in 1994, when I started my, my, my company, and it was really out of uh, Taipei, but I, I immediately moved like in 1995 uh, or late 94 to Hong Kong, because Hong Kong was in those days in 95, the commercial center for Asia Pacific. It was uh, the financial center, but it had the title of the gateway to China. Right. You haven't heard that title in like 15 years. Now it's no longer the gateway. You don't have to enter China through Hong Kong. You just come straight to Shanghai, straight to Beijing. It doesn't play that role anymore, but it used to. And the talent I would hire was Chinese American talent or regional talent that was studying in the United States. Okay. Yeah. So, in the early days, what I would do was I'd do these, my business was doing these road shows to the United States to go to Stanford, Harvard, Wharton, MIT, UCLA, you know, Northwestern. And I would contact not necessarily the career centers because they're lagging behind, but the student organizations, the international business student organizations. And I would go and I would talk about, you know, job market in China, how to get a job in China, you know, like that. Uh, key trends, uh, employment trends in China. And then I was uh, um, uh, working with exclusively multinationals, probably from the, the mid nineties to early to uh, like for the first five years. Uh, but, but 90%, 95% of our placements were uh, talent like you and me, Gene, you know, various forms, meaning either regional bilingual talent, uh, American born Chinese talent uh, or Taiwanese or Hong Kong Chinese, or the Sinophiles, meaning the non-Chinese talents, but East Asian studies majors, right? Mm -hmm. That speak Mandarin better than me, you know? But, <laughs> but there was a huge gap, a huge dearth and a, a, a tremendous need 
for more of that talent. They just, there just wasn't enough of it, you know? So, so that's kind of the wave I rode in terms of the talent development story and, and uh, the, the challenges going on at the time. But to your point, Gene, so I, I would say up until about, uh, uh, we'll say five years ago, uh, 90% of our clients were multinational, right? Now, 80% are Chinese companies, just like you said, Alibaba, Tencent, Didi, right? Didi is like the Uber of China, right? Uh, you know, these companies uh, and financial, you know, uh, which is uh, kind of a spinoff from, you know, but they're these Chinese companies that are really recruiting the same talent, meaning bilingual, international caliber talent, right? And the other thing I'll say is, Gene, starting from about um, maybe uh, 2000, mid, uh, 2005 or something like that, I would say uh, starting at that time, uh, about 90, 95% of our talent is Chinese-born talent. Mm. But with a, a Northwestern MBA, a Wharton MBA, uh, 10 years of experience in P&G, in GE, in Accenture, you know, uh, Citibank, right? Right. right? Because they haven't necessarily been overseas, worked in the United States, but they've developed their entire career in these multinational companies, working for foreign managers, foreign executives within a, a, a global company uh, structure, infrastructure system and stuff like that. So a lot of their sensibilities are kind of aligned with uh, international best practices and uh, the approach and the, the methodologies of, of how, how we do things in uh, Western world, you could yeah. say, it's certainly but been, in China, yeah. It's certainly been a trend and, and, and that, trend is just it's just happening so fast when did you hire your first local mainland chinese employee do you remember what year it was yeah sure uh so we set up our shanghai office in 1999 and that's when we did it you know so you that's, hired so so i have to i have to hire uh you know uh, local chinese you know like that yeah okay, so, that, so you hired your first china local chinese employee in 1999 so it's that's almost 20 years yes the question that I want to ask you is because you've been in the middle mm -hmm. of this trend, you know, back in the late nineties, even, you know, China was still trying to learn all of these best business practices from the West people who mm. you and I were almost kind of would be kind of on a pedestal because we were, we spoke English as a native language. Um, that obviously isn't as valuable at all now to speak yeah. English as a native language. I, I want to get your insights on how have the attitudes of the local Chinese changed as China has become more powerful on the global stage, as China companies have started to, to become more attractive, uh, where you know even China's military and China's influence, how the attitudes of the local Chinese that you manage have they changed i mean I, I assume in the beginning they were always very interested to learn from you as a foreigner mm. but how has that changed over time as you know chinese people now think they're as powerful as the united states um so when when you're kind of framing your question the first thing that comes to mind is like i haven't noticed any change Meaning, like, I worked with great people 20 years ago. They had great attitudes. They, they wanted to learn. They, they are, are genuine, sincere. They're gen, generous. And, and, uh, and I have those type of employees today. So maybe a, part of, a big part of that reason is because that's the type of employees I seek. And, and they, they're always around. They always exist. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, um, and, and I always find great, great uh, Chinese talent. Um, not all of them fit our culture, which I would describe as I want people more proactive, open, and just uh, very team-oriented and things like, like that. Now, the other thing I'll say, Gene, is that it's not like people are walking around here carrying their national flag on their back or draped in their national flag going like, you're American, I'm Chinese. No, I don't feel that at all, you know? Yeah, okay, maybe in, in, in a media level or at a political level or at a... You know, if you're going to have a debate or, uh, you know, uh, an, uh, an economic forum, 
you know, maybe at a government level, but but not at a, a you know a personal level. Certainly not. You know, it's just like we're all just people. You know, it's just like the same way. I'm not here dra wearing the, draping the American flag over my shoulders, going like like I'm an American. You know, no, I'm just you know enjoying uh, um, being a part of this. I have a huge uh, gratitude and uh, appreciation for my opportunity, uh, the chance to do what I have to do, and I think they feel the same way. So there's no underlying kind of like layer of, I don't talk politics with my, my, my staff, you know? And if we do talk about things, like we were just talking about trade yesterday, we were kind of like, just like, oh, wow, that's, yeah, that's, a, and, and we were just sharing. Mm. We weren't, we weren't like trying to convince each other of, of like, who's right, who's wrong, and like, blah, 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 like that, you know? We're just colleagues, you know? Just like I would have colleagues in the States. In fact, Probably it would be more contentious in the States because people are more uh, politically opinionated and blah, 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 you know, like that, you know? Yeah, so. I've never had a difficult conversation in my 20 years uh, since 99 with uh, like any of my colleagues or, or frankly anybody here uh, uh, that, that, that was this kind of nationalistic thing for two reasons. One is we don't talk about it. I mean, it's not something that either of us are interested in, in having a conversation. I'm not trying to convert anybody and they're not trying to convert me. Um, and then, um, uh, yeah, so, and then the second is, well, first, it doesn't come up. Second is, it's not, not really our orientation or interest, you know? Right. Now, We're just all human beings, Gene. <laughs> yeah. Now, yeah. you've been in China for, you know, 20 years or over 20 years. Yeah. Uh, what were the things that, you know, you don't, you know, especially in the, you know, in the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, you probably uh, were speaking more English and yeah. probably the people around you spoke less English than they do today. Um, other than language, what were some of the things that you struggled with culturally early on when you first started working in mainland China, which is different than Taiwan? So I wouldn't say I struggled with that much. Um, culturally uh in business situations or or i would say not as much in, in in like work situations i struggled more like sometimes in like the day-to-day -day situations like people cutting in front of you and not acknowledging you or just walking into you you know you know what i'm saying like on the street or you're you're standing in line you know what i'm saying like like more like like uh you've had that experience perhaps like Jane, uh, uh, you're standing and, and, and you're, you're next in line and somebody just walks right in front of you as if you're invisible, not there. And that used to annoy me or irritate me, you know, like, like that. But I would say with colleagues, you know, and, and working with people, not, not, not so much, you know, because uh, everybody that I've worked with and, and, and including clients, I feel like like uh, there's a fundamental sincerity and desire to be successful. You know what I'm saying? There's there's a common um, objective. We might do it a different way or have different habits, but but uh, we realize that we're coming from different backgrounds, so we're trying to figure out how to do it well. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like we don't have other agenda. Like like like. This is how our playbook works, you know, like the Western way or the Chinese way. It's like, oh, okay. I mean, we're trying to just innately understand how to be successful together, to get a result together. Mm. So, so when it comes to cross-cultural stuff, I have my own take on cross-cultural. I think it's overblown. I, I think, you know, cross-cultural is, is like, um, you know, cards with two hands don't offend anybody you know if you have respect if you have appreciation and generosity you're not going to offend people and i've seen that over and over again i've seen people who have never been to china they don't speak the language they know nothing about the history nothing about the culture and they work extremely well in this market because they don't bring a chip on their shoulder they don't bring an attitude they don't bring up well this is how we do it type of orientation they just go like hey um 
am I doing something wrong? Or it's like, is this, uh, is that, you know, or like, tell me if, you know, they're, they're, they have humility, you know? That's what cross-cultural is about. Yeah, but those, those are the people who are successful. Um, I've, you know, I've worked with a lot of foreign colleagues, American colleagues, German colleagues, and not all of them have such a healthy attitude when they come to China. Well, then they're never, they'll never be successful cross-culturally then. Then all the courses in the world are not going to help them, Gene. Right. You know, if you're that type of person, you won't get along with other people in, in the, you know, your own country, perhaps, you know. So that's what I'm saying. That's my point, Gene. You know, this all cross-cultural thing, like, you know, you got, a, you know, cards with two hands and, you know, like, use your chopsticks in a certain way. It has nothing to do with anything, Gene. No, that, yeah, I agree with that. I, I, yeah, so, so if a person brings an attitude here, I'm sorry, they can take all the cross-cultural, they can read history books, they can get a master's in, you know, in Chinese, you know, uh, uh, modern history and stuff like that. It, it's, it's not going to help them that much. No, it may not help them, but you, you probably have encountered a lot of foreigners who don't have healthy attitudes. Yeah, that's... that's that's right, but but uh, let me put it this way, Gene. Um, yeah, okay. So, uh, and I've encountered Chinese that are maybe a little bit difficult too. They're they're stubborn. You know, you know what I'm saying? I, yeah. If, if if a person fundamentally doesn't have the right nature, attitude, orientation, doesn't respect other people, is arrogant, they're going to have problems. Yeah. No, you're exactly. It's a right. human nature thing to me. It's a human nature. It's not a uh, a nationalistic or cultural thing to me. Right. So, That's my take. Yeah, so I also wanted to say that we failed to mention something during the introduction. And I think this is probably tied directly to everything that you've been doing. You're also the author of three books. Is that how many you've written? Yeah, yeah, three books, yeah. So, <laughs> it's amazing to me when I, I think about that and say that because I, I never set out to write books, you know. Yeah, but obviously... Just a, can, can you hand me a couple of books? You know the game, play the game. Yeah, yeah. yeah so this will be on. Yeah. So obviously, this the books that you've written are all related to the things that we're talking about now. The things that you're passionate Correct. about, which is Correct. basically helping people find successful careers or develop successful yes. careers in this environment that is China. Yeah. Yeah. So, by the way, this is, this is, these are the books you're talking about, or two of them. One is called Know the Game, Play the Game, mm -hmm. okay. and the other is called, it's called DFID, but it stands for How to Develop Yourself as a Future Executive Today. And they're really about two things, career sense and soft skills, right? They're more kind of at a, you know, rather than the hard skills, because if you know China talent, you know, they're very industrious, hardworking, disciplined, um, very, very uh, smart, you know? Um, uh, uh, but the education system doesn't nurture the uh, the soft skills, communication, people skills, um, you know, uh, leadership, uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, the creativity, the resourcefulness, the solutions oriented, you know, being solutions oriented. And so, um, and, and then also a lot of people graduate from uh, the university or the education system here uh, and enter the real world totally unprepared. Because the education system here is extremely academic. Exams, classroom, books, uh, memorizing information. It's changing, but very slowly, you know. Now they're encouraging uh, school activities, internships, um, independent studies, you know, right? Going, going off campus and, and being more engaged. They, they have a lot of these uh, competitions for uh, kind of like entrepreneurial uh, uh, ventures and things like that. So people can get some some real life uh, 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 exposure and experience, right? Like that. But in the day, like it was, it wasn't something. Soft skills was not even a concept for a lot of uh, uh, the local talent in their twenties and thirties. And so I wrote these two books about uh, one soft skills, but also career sense, like. You know, this one is about, it says, you know, pursuing your career success in a multinational company, right? What does it so take those, to be a global caliber professional? Yeah. So those books are mainly written for a Chinese audience. Yeah. My first book, though, was called The New Gold Mountain. I don't have that, but that was my first book. I wrote it in 96. It was written for people like you and me, Jane. Because okay. my first book, the first thing I wanted to do was try to kind of encourage more people 
people like us to be out here. God, this is a great time and place. So I wrote it, you know, uh, the New Bull Mountain is a reference to uh, Zhou Jingshan. Zhou Jingshan is the name for San Francisco. The San Francisco was the point of immigration back in the 20s, 30s, whatever, turn of the century, the previous century, uh, uh, the old gold mountain, right? Mm. And so now China is becoming for our generation the new gold mountain or had become the new gold mountain, the land of opportunity for Chinese Americans if we really wanted to leverage our background and, and uh, take advantage of a, a great uh, kind of a, a period of growth and development. Yeah. Let's yeah. Talk about so that was my first book. It was written for Chinese Americans. I was trying to plant a flag for people like us just to go like, hey, guys, you know, check it out. Just come out here, you know, and um, there are great opportunities. And I profiled a lot of people doing all sorts of over and over again. The, the, the line I just remember over and over again. I never imagined. I never would have thought I'd be doing something. They were doing things that, you know, were totally so far beyond what they ever could have pictured. And I'm an example. Never thought of being an entrepreneur, never thought of doing talent and things like that. Like you said, an engineer now doing what I'm doing. But that was the nature of the market. It was so open. It was so underdeveloped with so many needs and challenges that you could, even if you weren't experienced at it, well, why not you? Yeah. You know, everyone's learning it together. It's the early starting point. Yeah. So well, the, goal, the new Gold Mountain, I think, was definitely uh, appropriate in the late 90s. But mm -hmm. in today's, in the current day and age, you know, being a American born Chinese who doesn't have any experience in China and doesn't speak the language that well and doesn't understand the culture that well, it's not really a gold mountain for those people because I get a lot of questions from a lot of different people who want to come to China. And it's yeah. difficult to get hired to work in China because companies in China simply don't need foreign talent anymore. Yeah. So that's correct. So that Nouveau Mountain was written in 96. That's 22 years ago. That, that, that time has passed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. That ship has sailed a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Well, let's, let's and the only on. reason I'm, I'm here and, and you know, I, I, I can make my, you know, do what I do here is because I've put in the time, you know, yeah. you know. Yeah. But if, if you were, you're right, Gene, if you're a fresh start, say you're Chinese American, you don't really speak uh, much Mandarin and you're a guy out here. Then uh, how do you outcompete a local talent? You know what, what's your advantage over local talent? But there is opportunity here. But you just have to start and compete head to head. You know there isn't a significant advantage. Right. No. There's opportunity. There's an oppor There's opportunity still relative to the United States. There's still more opportunity, but there's not a significant advantage. Yeah, especially compared to 20 years ago. Correct. Yeah. So yeah. I want to talk about the. The two things that you just mentioned, but I want to talk about them separately. One is career sense and one is soft skills. So yes, uh, let's first talk about soft skills. So uh, you've yeah. written yeah. this book for mainly a Chinese audience. Uh, Correct. What, what do you think are the soft skills that most Chinese talent lack to be successful, high caliber global professionals? So... Um... And how can they change that? I would, say, I, I would tell you that there, there are two categories. One is the qualities, okay? Qualities. So qualities would be like proactive. That's a big one. They tend to be more, you know, beidong, which is more passive. You know, they, uh, you know they're not going to express their ideas. They're not going to uh, kind of like uh, uh, initiate, you know? They might have an idea, but you, they're not going to volunteer necessarily. You got to ask them. And then the, they, it turns out they have something to say, or they have an opinion, or they have an idea, things like that. That's one. And the second is just like, um, I think the uh, resourcefulness and, and kind of solutions orientation to, to really seek out, because they're used to maybe process and following instruction, right? Because the education system is, uh, read this, take this exam, study this, learn this information. And so they always like are seeking answers. They're always just like, they tell me the answer, right? And if they have the answer, they can reproduce the answer, right? But in terms of like, um, I think figuring things out and, 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 and going that, I mean, I, I think clearly a lot more, but their orientation for a lot of the people is not quite, quite that way, okay? So there are qualities like that, uh, proactive, resourcefulness, uh, solutions oriented, okay? But the, the, the capabilities, I would say are related to communication skills, number one. Mm -hmm. 
the, the, the communicate because again, now, it's not like they're bad communicators, but a lot of times they won't speak out to begin with, right? Or there, there's a whole thing they're not they're not as straightforward. And by the way, it's not that they're not straightforward with uh, uh, Westerners or foreigners; it's even with each other. I just yesterday somebody made a comment like. I said, I didn't really get what she was saying. I was talking to my colleague who's Chinese about another woman who was doing a one-day trial with us. And my colleague said, I didn't really understand what she was saying either. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Even though she was saying it in Chinese, she was saying it in English to me, to Chinese to him, but neither of us could get what she was saying. You know, So the communication and you know, I think more hit the point, straightforward and, and kind of more just kind of, uh, I think just like expressing, expressing what you really, thinking you know like that okay and then the, the other one the big one is kind of the leadership thing it's it's a very individualistic thing here very few people graduate university with any leadership experience meaning when i was uh, in my mba program you know student organizations clubs right you know or you we've been in, uh, involved in uh, sports teams right yeah. so we we know what team 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 is about you know and things like that and then also uh, uh, leadership. But a lot of people in China, you know, that's, that's a new thing. And so I think um, uh, uh, that's something that, you know, everybody has that potential, but it's not nurtured in the education system here in China. Yeah. yeah now when you talk and so, about, by the way, yeah, yeah. When you talk about those qualities uh, that many Chinese people lack, which mm. would all kind of be falling into this soft skills, you know, being proactive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do people change their mindset to develop those qualities? Or how do, I mean, how do Chinese people either train to, to, to acquire those qualities or how, how do they improve their careers? So I think it's like anybody, Gene. I think, you, you know, what's very critical is going to be being in an environment that's going to encourage you to do that and working for people who nurture that and encourage that in you, right? And just, you know, so so if you're part of an open office environment, right, where it's it's just encouraged and every day the morning meeting, your boss is going like, hey, so guys, what do you think? Oh, you know, and it's done in a very, you know, kind of, a, you could say, uh, well, encouraging is, is the word that comes to mind, encouraging way, right? And so it's it's hard to change your habit. You read a book and it, you're in a vacuum. You have to practice it. You have to just, you know, push yourself and kind of, you know, just get, get out of your comfort zone and things like that. But, but um, that's that's important. You have to be in, a, in an environment that will help you uh, uh, nurture that and, and work with people that you can, uh, you could say, develop that that quality around. Yeah. Well, I definitely know that that you create that environment in your workplace and you bring on a yeah. lot of interns. So yeah. within what you can control, you're providing that environment for people to develop those qualities and develop those skills. Yeah. What about just yeah. Chinese person listening and he's not going to be able to work for you or work with you. So, so what I tell people is this, it's like, uh, so I have like uh, certain things. I, I, I talk to people about their career development and I, and I go, Here's a, a, a huge factor, top three factor. If your platform has limitations, they'll be your limitations too for your growth and development. So if you work for a state-owned enterprise, you work for a local company, you work for a boss who just like doesn't want to listen to you, doesn't, says no to everything you do, then, then it's, it's, you're not going to nurture it. So what I'm encouraging people to do is, you know, choose platforms not or environments not based on title, salary, you know, uh, uh, old famous company, but you know, evaluate the 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 situation, the culture, the environment, the people you work for, right? Mm -hmm. So, so Gene, these the answer is you got to back it up. You, meaning, it's 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 like if you're not in the right situation, it won't happen. The first step is you got to find the right situation, you know. And so I I get Q and A's all the time from people. Oh, my boss doesn't listen to me. Oh, my, oh I just sit. Nobody talks to me. This is then, then nothing's going to change. I'm sorry. You have, yeah. Un, until you change your situation or are able to get in a better situation, then um, and it doesn't have to be a big famous company. Go to a small environment. There are a lot of quality uh, entrepreneurial smaller environments. They're just naturally more open, more flexible, more practical, right? Mm. Well, I, 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 my situation is like that. Like if you're in a smaller situation, 
there are fewer voices. People got to speak out. You you have to you have to participate in a smaller environment, yeah. right? Because every person is is important. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I, you know we 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 worked worked together, and I've known you for a while. So I definitely know that you are really sincerely passionate about mm. helping young professionals develop into high quality uh, yeah. global professionals. Um, I yeah. want to change topics a little bit on uh, you were, you've been very successful on a Chinese platform called Zuku. So yes. are you still doing webinars on that platform? Uh, we are just planning another one, but I haven't done one maybe six months, but I, I've done about 10, 10, 10 of them, something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So obviously that's a way for you to reach a much larger audience with your, you know, your advice and your wisdom and, and helping people develop their careers. Wisdom makes me sound old, Gene. <laughs> My knowledge, insights, wisdom makes me sound like I'm Yoda. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, a lot of people who are in my audience yes. are interested in doing what you have done. So I, I want mm. to kind of tell my audience how you got started with Zuku and how you built the following and how you started to actually monetize your influence on this platform. So um, I would just say, you know, I because I haven't been in the States in a long time, but I I'm told that Juhu is like Koros, Koros, right? Yeah, Koros. Right. It's, 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 you know, people post questions and then um, uh, people like me or, or it could be anybody kind of chime in and, and, you know, respond to the questions and the popular ones get uh, kind of uh, likes and they get kind of elevated, right? Like that. So, you know, I just been doing it. Uh, I started maybe two years ago or something like that. And then I just have my colleagues because I can't read Chinese. It's all in Chinese. I'd say, pick me some questions, popular questions, you know, career related, and they would, and then I'd, I'd respond to them. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd write a response and I'd post it. And then people would, you know, if they uh, think it's, it's a, a beneficial, helpful uh, answer, then they'll, they'll, um, they'll like it or they'll save it or they'll forward it and things like that. So, so it's just, I think like any of these other social media platforms like that, and then I, I would just do those on a regular basis, maybe respond to two or three questions a week. And then after a year, you've responded to maybe, I don't know, like uh, 80, 100 questions, you know, like that. Yeah, so how big and and then, then, then people uh, start knowing who you are, you know, like that. How big is your yeah. following on uh, Zippo now? I, I'm not active on it now, but it might be around 50,000, 45 to 50,000, you know, but, but it's been that number, you know, even... Probably eight months ago was that. I, I really haven't been doing much on Juhu anymore. Uh, my my big one, biggest one now is Weibo. Weibo is like the Twitter of China. I have 160,000 on, on Weibo. Oh, wow. Yeah, and then I, I, I started in November, I had 5,000. Yeah, so I've picked those up in the last seven months. Yeah. So uh, I think my audience, because a lot of them want to do business in China, what mm -hmm. is the strategy to actually that you use to actually increase your following on Weibo? I mean, to go from 5,000 to 170,000. So, you know, there, there's a, uh, uh, the, 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 the saying we use, and this is a line from, uh, you might know Darcy. So Darcy kind of uh, started her own company, but she used to be my marketing manager. She come up with this uh, catchphrase. It's like, content is king, channels are queen. So there are these great channels out there and they're all seeking quality content now. And so if you have content, if you're a writer, if you can do videos, you know, then you know you have you can post and and the the market both uh, the channels that are kind of distributing but also the users out there are 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 really hungry for quality content and the key is quality right so so the evolution of China social media is maybe following the rest of the world but not kind of in step you know maybe uh, uh, five six years seven years uh, five six years ago when Weibo and WeChat become popular you know. The first phase is just entertainment. Oh, look at that. Oh, that's a funny story. Oh, hey, you know, you know so, okay, that gets old. And then it goes to information, right? Right? And then now people want information. They want to, but then, okay, then, the, but there's a lot of garbage out there. But now it's value. Hmm. Now, you know, people are discerning and they're more sophisticated and they just don't want their time wasted. They've read enough blogs where people are 
expounding this and that and this and that, but I have no expertise. Mm -hmm. So I would just say it's like, um, you know, uh, uh, just, you know, um, you, you got to write, you got to be able to write, or you got to be able to, 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 uh, convey, you know, whatever expertise you have, right? Like that. So you and, 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 and I would say, here's the other thing I would say, Gene, um, I, I absolutely could not do this without my local staff and my social media staff, you know, or my marketing team, they're between 22 to 25 years old. So they know it. And, and I'm like, what do I do? What do you, what do you think? How do you like this? How's this style? They go, it's too formal. It's too professional. It's too dry. It's a more personal, more story you know, like that. I'm, I'm just like, okay, okay. Okay. You know? Yeah. So you yeah. Basically listen, listen to them because actually. Absolutely. They're the demographic that you're actually trying to help anyway. Absolutely. Right. I mean, you're not Absolutely. trying to help 40 year olds or 50 year olds. You're trying to help the young people who yeah, yeah, yeah. are still trying to develop their careers. Yeah. So I'm having a great time doing it because, you know, our generation, we don't have that habit, Gene, of just like staring at our phone, blah, 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 you know, blah, 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 like checking our phone. That's not really our habit. And, and social media, um, you could say, content is different from like say uh, LinkedIn content to me. LinkedIn is more professional, it's structured, but social media has to be engaging because the attention span in social media is, is very quick. It's like this, right? But LinkedIn, people go to, to seek your content, right? So, so they have more of a, it's a more professional audience. It's more kind of purposeful, right? But, but a lot of like, link, like, like WeChat, Weibo, so your headlines have to be, you know, uh, the, the, the title of your content, the initial, like, like I don't know, short description of, of what your thing is about. The first line has to be really good. And, and then the, uh, the article itself has to be, uh, for lack of a better word, entertaining. Mm, it has to be entertaining you know? and valuable. Yes, yes. It has to be engaging. Engaging. Now, yeah. are you... 140,000 Weibo followers, are you able to monetize that? Oops. Oh, sorry about that, Gene. Oh, that's all right. Okay, yeah. Are you able right, to not. monetize that, or, or how does that benefit your business? So, so I've been doing social media, so now I'm in a phase of product, hmm. of product. Did so you? now developing online product and, and some offline. So I, I haven't been in the training game in about 10 years, but I, I, I developed a, a, a workshop series about uh, uh, four months ago, it's called Seven Steps to Achieving Your Career Success. And then it's like dot, dot, um, uh, a systematic approach to your career development. You know, so it's this career sense and systematic approach and things, seven steps. Because I used to expound career sense. Jershan Wong stands for, translated means career sense. But that's too soft. It's too fluffy and big for people because they just want, you know, <laughs> straightforward, practical tangible right so this seven steps you know is like okay systematic approach i think that for the sensibilities of this the audience in this market they they like that okay it's seven steps okay one two three four five like that systematic approach okay so it's very structured you know like that okay. but anyways to answer your question um so these followers uh you know we're starting to i don't promote a lot of product but i'm starting to so I'm also developing a new uh, online subscription product. It's a daily subscription where people pay 99 yuan. It's 50 days, and it's called More Than Career English. Dot dot. How to develop? Uh, uh, how to accelerate your development as a global caliber professional? Mm. Right. And then it's three minutes, about three three and a half minutes every day. And I I I the the content is related to career development. Mm. Right. But it's in English. It has uh, subtitles, and it also has a bilingual transcript. It has a golden rule. It has a uh, uh, like assignment of the day. So these are very popular in China, right? So you might have known. I have this one last year that uh, it's about four thousand five hundred copies at ninety nine yuan each. I, I produced that. That was a hundred days, but that was audio. It's called it's Weiku. It was like a hundred days to improve your career English. I'm not an English teacher, Gene, you know that, but, but the, the channel, that's how they promoted it. But, but my content is really about your career development and career, developing your career sense. 
So that's why we like, I'm doing this product. The last year's product, Waku, was uh, a cooperation. But the one I'm doing this more than Career English. I like it because it's already implying that it's not just Career English. It's more than Career English. How to accelerate your development as a global college professional. Very practical for a lot of people, right? And so now I'm leveraging like, like it's in English. I don't have to apologize for my poor Chinese. Okay. Like you want to be a global college professional, it's going to be in English. But it's not just the English. That, that will be a benefit. But my introduction is far beyond improving your English. It's going to help develop your global caliber mindset and ability to, you know, how things are done. Yeah. Right. So, okay. and, and this more than Kerr English is going to be like a dummy series. That's what for dummy. More than Kerr English, develop your, sorry, your global caliber. More than Kerr English, how to interview with um, uh, um, uh, foreign managers. More than Kerr English, how to, uh, prepare yourself for uh, opportunities overseas. Yeah. Yeah. Now, this happens with a lot of KOLs and influencers in the U.S. where their the revenue from the digital and online products starts exceeding their traditional business. So, Absolutely, Gene. Absolutely. I don't want to be training 100 days a year. I don't want to be putting stuff out there that uh, people can buy 24 7. Right. So, yeah. You got, you know, these days, you know, there are these platforms and channels um, that uh, uh, you got to take advantage of it, which people of our generation, Gene, they, they, it's, like, it's like a fantasy. For, it's interesting. I show my, 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 uh, uh, my Waku product to some, some people in their 40s, and they're like, they, they, they just like, it's, 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 it's like something they, they can't imagine, you know? But that is today's world, and that's why a lot of younger people, they're, they're plugged into these... Uh, social media channels and things like that and what's popular, but absolutely, you know, yeah. I mean, cost efficiency wise, uh, distribution, just effectiveness. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So, and particularly in China, because, you know, Ch Gene, China is, is like all about mobile phone and, and like they have the Alipay and everything is online and the infrastructure is amazing. Yeah. yeah. So basically you're selling, people are taking your course on the subway and they're paying you yeah. million yen yeah. to listen to three minutes a day. So yes, yes, yes. And there's 1.4 billion people in China. So there's definitely yes. a lot of people that you can reach. Yes. yes. Okay. So let me, uh, the final thing that we want to kind of shift gears about, I just also, uh, you know, you've, you're now a father of two lovely children. <laughs> Your, Thank you. Yeah, your your wife is, um, is is still a very young Chinese gal from Beijing. Yes. Uh, so there's a couple of things that I want to talk about. First is um, successful habits is something that you help a lot of people develop. I want to yes. understand a little bit about your successful habits. I mean, how do you stay disciplined to exercise? And do you have kind of things that you do to keep you centered, like meditation or affirmation or like the secret? I mean, how do you stay so energized and, and so focused on, on just being successful? So, um, you know, everything is about uh, what you do. And is that aligned with what you care about? Yeah. Right whether that's my work or my personal life, you know? And so, you know, I, things, I'm, I'm not going through the motions these days. Remember I, at the beginning of this broadcast, I was saying like my previous job in LA, I had a great lifestyle, but I was in my job, I was going through the motions, but now, and you know, what I do is important to me. It, it's, it's purposeful. I, I have a passion for it. You mentioned that Larry clearly have a passion and I do, you know? And so that's what keeps me young. I, 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 I don't have to self-motivate myself. I was responding to this journal question about like, oh, how do you motivate? Like, well, you know, if you, if you find the right thing that, that really matters to you, then it's not that difficult to have that energy, to feel that, right? Because you care. You, you, you want to be really good. It, your success at what you do matters to you, you know? And for my personal life, it's kind of the same thing. It's like, um, you know, I'm, I'm very fortunate. I'm really late in the game, but I, I there's two, like you say, beautiful kids. Um, my son's four and a half, my daughter's two. And so uh, I just want to be everything to them. And I want to be there. I want to be active. You know, I don't want to be this like my age, like a lot of people 
might be a grandfather to kids that young, you know, my, but, um, you know, I, I want to, uh, enjoy them. Like, you know, uh, uh, with my son kind of play ball with him and stuff like that. But, but I would say like, I'm, I don't have any sophisticated, I don't do yoga. I don't do meditation, but, but one thing I have a very innate kind of a sense of balance. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I'm saying? Yep. I work hard, but when I get tired, I sleep. When I'm hungry, I eat. <laughs> when when I, I feel lethargic, I exercise. You know, it's kind of like that. I just, I just like, I'm really trying to be in tune with uh, what, what, what I'm, I'm, I'm experiencing. And, and, an example, if I do feel tired, I need to slow down a little bit. You know, I need to listen to my body, you know. And, and I always have longevity in mind because I'm late in the game as a dad. It's like, okay, I got to take care of myself. That, that never leaves my mind, you know, like that. And uh, I don't know how I really developed that, but, um, you know, maybe I take after my mom a little bit. You know, she's, she's a very dedicated career woman and uh, passionate. She's like, you know, 85. She still makes trips to, the night, night, uh, to China to do consulting and projects, 85 years old, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, she... Uh, you know, we're like everything she does, she's all in. She's all in when she works, but then she shifts. She, and the, the thing is, is like when you're that type of person and you approach it that way, you're not spending all your time regretting and kind of like eating it yourself and kind of doing those things that psychologically and emotionally are unhealthy to you. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I'm not saying I don't have frustrations or disappointments, but um, uh, I can live with my failures or i can live with my disappointments because i it, it's the best i could do mm. and everything i do is just straightforward that way so my mind is not that complex <laughs> you know <laughs> you know i mean I, I have a lot of things going on in my mind but i do what's important and and that's that's it yeah you know if you could figure I, out how to train or teach other people to have that mindset you have that would be a fortune. Well, well within training, Gene, I, I try to tell people like, like I try to do get into mindset and root, root cause. And I know there's a lot more training these days about mindfulness, right? Yeah. Right? Like purpose and, uh, you know, kind of, um, I don't know. But, but I try to get down to things like, like, for instance, a lot of people have fear. You know what I'm saying? They want to do something they have fear, you know? And I used to have fear, like leaving engineering, which was my comfort zone. And I could do it, and I, I have built my career up to that point on that. Like, but I was afraid to move forward. But then I was even more afraid to not move forward. And so then I just break it down to a simple thing. I have a choice. Both of them I'm going to be afraid, but this one has upside. This one has no upside. And so then I just like, okay, I'm going to go into the unknown. At least I might suck. I might fail. I might you know, embarrass myself. But at least I have an opportunity to improve my situation. This one. I know what the verdict is going to be. There's no upside on, on this choice, you know. So, so you know, I try to break things down to very simple decisions, you know, and, and things like that. But anyways. That definitely and I just try to encourage people. Yeah, like that. Yes, that fear. You know, yeah, yeah. So, so I, I can see that definitely has worked well for you in business. So the last thing that we want to talk about is uh, your wife, Layla, is not... An American, yes. Uh, so that's correct. Um, so, in your dating life, in your marriage life, now in your family life, uh, what are some of the main kind of cultural differences that you may or may not struggle with in your yeah. relationship? So, I think the biggest one, uh, uh, which is more recent, is like. Uh, 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 kids it's with the kids the upbringing and the orientation of the kids you know what i'm saying because yeah. in china china the education system is is it's like it's very structured it's super competitive right right so i think like i would say one of the biggest things layla worries more about the ed, like the kids like she's anticipating five years ten years in advance you know what's going to happen it's like Okay, he's not in kindergarten yet. So just let him, he'll figure it out. We'll figure it out along the way. Let's give it a little chance to evolve. So I'm a little bit like a holistic big picture thing. But, but she knows the education system in China. And you got to start competing today. You got to start getting ready today. 
you know, like that. How old is Mickey now? Four and a half. Well, going to be five. Yeah. In China, He'll be, kids start going to school at around, I think, 18 months. Yeah. Yeah. He was two <laughs> years old. He went to preschool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's like daycare, really. Daycare, I should say. Yeah. Well, is she kind of in line with you? Because a lot of the things that she's talking about is what you were talking about early on in, in our in our discussion, where Chinese go through this really rigorous test kind of yeah. test based academic thing where you have to take tests to get to the next school or take tests to get to the yeah, next yeah. school. And so she's preparing Mickey to be able to actually, you know, get into a good high school, get into a good college. But yeah. but what you just said is that in order for people to be high caliber professional, it's more about the soft skills. Yes, yes, yeah. So, so I would say it's, it's more like this, Gene. It's like, she's like 70, 75%. She understands soft skills and she understands well-rounded, right? And e experienced, right? But, but she's more like, okay, he's got to have the discipline and things like that. I'm probably the other way around. You know, I'm like 70, 75%. Let's just like explore. Let's just like, Give him a chance to play, to develop his personality, but, you know, 25, 30% on the discipline and stuff like that. I know that's important, but, but I'm more into personality development, uh, you know, where she might be a little bit more into habits. But it's like there's definitely an overlap. It's not like she has this school of thought, I have this school of thought. No. It's just the, the level that we might be oriented around habits versus, you know, kind of like personality, you know, uh, you know kind of. Yeah, yeah, like that. I think what you're describing is is what I'm anticipating I'm going to experience when I have children with my wife, who is also uh, good for you. Yeah, um, yeah, um, yeah, for sure. It's you know, but I'm. Yeah. I think I might be f fortunate that I'm in America, so the larger macro environment will be more conducive to letting children play, and it's not as competitive as here, especially yeah. early schools. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, we, we uh, Mickey went to a bilingual school. He had a, a Western uh, kind of a, a foreign teacher and a Chinese, uh, a, a female um, Chinese teacher. So it was really a great environment, best of both worlds. And, and he's, uh, he definitely takes a lot after me. He's a happy-go-lucky guy. He's cheeky. He's got a great sense of humor. He's fun-loving. Uh, but he's... His teacher says, hey, he's really, uh, really switched on guys, really sharp. Uh, he, he can do it. He, he might be the classic kind of American, uh, like, like, you know, he has the talent, but sometimes he's just a little lazy. <laughs> he's not focused, you know, things like that. Yeah. What is Mickey's first language? Is it English or Chinese? Oh, he's totally bilingual in both ways. In fact, his Chinese exceeds mine now. I'm like, hey, Mickey, slow down, slow down. I say, Mickey, what does that mean? It goes, ba ba, ba ba. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that, that's funny. So um, it is. All right. But he's 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 he can toggle like it's it's no accent on either side. So that's going to be a huge advantage for him when he eventually gets yeah. into his career. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's going to be a huge advantage. So I don't think Layla has anything to worry about as far as him being competitive. In, in his in his career <laughs> we hope we hope <laughs> yeah so um so as we wrap this up i'm just uh one final question uh do you plan to retire in china or are you going to someday come back to the u.s well so Layla and i talk about this and i was just in the states and my family like uh dad and my brother and sister were asking me i was like but we would come back for the kids so when, when Mickey gets to about fifth or sixth grade, we, we do think we want to bring him to the United States for his education, you know? So, and, and then Laura too, which who's two years behind him, two and a half years behind him. So that would be the main reason. But my view of it is the world is just getting smaller with technology, with, and, you know, honestly, I've made so many of these, you know, like US, China flights, you know, and I know people who, I wouldn't say they commute, but they, they go every other month and stuff. And. And I'm not one of these people who, who goes like, uh, well, it's, you know, uh, it's, it's 12 o'clock in the, at night in the United States or three in the morning. I'm not one of these people who, who it's a big deal to travel cross continent and stuff like that, you know? 
so my meaning is I, I think, you know, they'll probably have holograms, you know, like in five or six years that you, it's like the person is sitting next to you, you know, so I don't worry about it that much. You know? mm -hmm. But I like being out here, you know, uh, you know, I generally like being out here. Yeah. Well, it's fun. I, there's, there's definitely, there's definitely a, a fun factor. There's a vibe here, you know, and, and you can tell like for a person who wants to do things, be involved, active, you know, it's, it's a great place to be, you know. Well, I'm not going to say that that you have a lot of wisdom to share, but I'm gonna. What I will say is that you're definitely making a difference in China. Uh, Try uh, the things Try. that you are yep. doing, the the platforms that you are building, uh, the content that you are disseminating. You know, it's really gonna it's really gonna change a lot of people's lives. I mean, I hope so. You know, I'm I'm trying to do that. You know, I'm I'm trying to. Uh, you know, impact is probably the key word. I, I, I would like to reach more people. I mean, I've been doing it with my recruitment firm, you know, because I do a lot of uh, uh, coaching of the candidates, but I, I do want to reach uh, more people because every candidate I talk to, you know, uh, uh, the things that I share with them are the things that I've shared with many other people. So I know that there are a lot of very common issues and challenges that, that people need help with. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the things yeah. that you're doing, you're, you're in a hot spot. Uh, I just, you know, I, I work with some companies and, and we talk about some HR issues. And I just remember uh, reading a McKinsey article where McKinsey interviewed 2,000 human resource directors or CEOs in China. And they asked them what was the number one challenge for Chinese talent or Chinese local Chinese employees? What was the, the biggest gap? And the number one answer was Chinese people lack the big picture. Yeah. It was just, mm -hmm. it just made so much sense based yeah. on how they're educated. And yeah, yeah. It's yeah. not like they're bad. There's nothing wrong with that. But that's yeah, just yeah. getting to the next level. Is, is yeah. The health of so it is kind of a mindset thing of a view and a perspective and things like that. Because they, they do tend to like focus on practical and tangible and answers and this, you know, specific um thing they, they look at things in that way it's not that they don't have the ability but like you said it's not really nurtured in their early education you know like that yeah i think one other final thing that my audience might be interested in if 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 somebody is a small company or or even an entrepreneur and they're looking to from america or from outside of china and they're looking to hire people in china how would they contact you and would you be interested in working with them as clients? Sure, sure. So, you know, my uh, uh, email address, I, I, I think you asked for all our social media, my social media and my uh, stuff, but my email address, I'm, I'm happy to give it out. It's LC Wang, uh, uh, W-A-N-G, uh, at Wang hyphen Lee, L-I dot com, you know, LC Wang at Wang dash Lee dot com. So, yeah, yeah, they uh, feel free to contact me. I'm, I'm not on the uh, U.S. Uh, social media. I don't have Facebook. I don't have Instagram or Twitter. Things like that, but um, you have LinkedIn. but we'll give everybody. I do have LinkedIn. Yeah, my LinkedIn. Uh, God, I can't remember, but they can look no, me up. I have, it. I have it. Yeah, you have it. Oh, so great, great. Sure great. It. Yeah. Make sure everybody gets that. Great. Appreciate it. Yeah. All right. Well, Larry, thank you for sharing your time, and uh, I think you're doing great work in China, and and thank you for being on the podcast and sharing your story with our audience. Yeah. Well, Gene, it's great to see you in this role, and. Uh, uh, very exciting. And when you first told me about it, I was like, hey, that's awesome, man. Good for you. You know, we, we might try to take a page out of your book. Uh, I might have a follow-up talk with you about, you know, how, how you, you do what you're doing. Yeah, I think it's great. Yeah. Well, we, we can definitely explore some collaborations moving forward. Okay. Sounds All right. great. All right. Thank you. Okay. Man. All right, Gene, you're looking good. All right. You take care. And thanks for this uh, chance to, uh, to uh, uh, share some of the things I've, I've right. uh, done and, and seen. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. See you later. Thanks, Gene.